I'm going to go ahead and call this March 20th, 2017 meeting of the City Council to order. And I would ask as our first order of business for Bridger to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, Bridger. We'll move on to item three, which is our communications from the public. And this is time set aside for the public to comment on items that are on the agenda, but not advertised as a public hearing or anything you would like to bring to the attention of the council. Just for the record, when you approach the podium, your name and address, please. Any public comment tonight? Not seeing any, we'll stay with the audience. Any volunteer board reports? How about the council? Richard. The um, committee that's working on the uh, action plan for um, it meets tomorrow um, at five o'clock right here. City Council okay. Chambers. Thanks, Richard. Any other board reports? Not seeing any. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Any changes or additions to the minutes from March 6th? Or can I have a motion? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. It was seconded by Councillor Williams. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that carries unanimously. Michelle? Which moves us quickly on to <coughs> agenda item six, which is our public hearings for this evening. And we do have six public hearings tonight. We will start with item 6A, which is a consideration of a request from Catherine Farber for a conditional use permit to construct an accessory apartment at 604 Summers Avenue. Bailey. Good evening. So the first one. Um, so this is a request for a conditional use permit in order to construct an accessory apartment at 604 Summers Avenue. The property is zoned WR2, which is our two family residential district. Um, and the growth policy does designate this property as urban. Um, the property is currently developed with a single family residence. Um, the accessory apartment would be located above a proposed two-car garage at the rear of the property. Uh, it would be an L-shaped uh, garage approximately 14 feet wide by 30 feet long and would total four, or, excuse me, 594 square feet. Um, there would be an uncovered, unenclosed deck uh, uh, proposed off the apartment that would be about 12 feet wide by 15 feet long. Um, the proposed garage would access the existing alley on the west side of the garage. Uh, the subject property is 6,500 square feet, so it does comply with our minimum lot size. Um, it would be connected to all city services, city utilities. Um, we did mail a notice of, to the adjacent landowners within 150 feet of the property on January 27th. Um, and we emailed advisory agencies as well. And we did place a legal in the Whitefish Pilot on February 1st. Um, we've had no comments received on this project. Um, just kind of to hit some highlights um, in the criteria. Um, the development proposal is consistent with the purpose and intent of our regulations. Um, the project does meet all of our requirements. Um, additionally, the accessory apartment would meet or exceed the setbacks for an accessory structure. Currently, the plans that we had submitted um, do show the northern property line at 9 feet 10 inches, where the minimum required setback is 10 feet. Um, and as a requirement of the building permit approval, they would have to shift the building slightly south in order to comply with the 10 foot setback. Um, and that would be shown at building permit typically. Um, the subject property, as I said, does comply with the minimum lot size and widths for our zoning, for the WR2 zoning. Um, as I said, the accessory apartment in the garage would access from a private driveway on an existing alley, which is adjacent to 6th Street. Um, they are also showing a direct access to the garage from 6th Street itself. Um, and currently the plan shows the proposed access approximately 30 feet from the edge of the existing alley. However, we do have some comment from Public Works saying that the setback actually needs to be a minimum of 35 feet from the edge of the alley pavement. So they would have to shift it over just a little bit as well, but they do have plenty of room to do that. Um, and that has been included as a condition of approval. Um, Parking, they are required to show two parking spaces for the single family dwelling and one off street parking space for the accessory apartment. Um, the proposed lot does provide adequate access um, to accommodate all parking needs on site and they are showing two parking spaces within the proposed garage as well. 
Um, the stormwater drainage would be reviewed at Public Works um, by the Public Works Department at the time of building permit. Um, if they exceed the allowable amount, they may have to do an engineered stormwater plan, but it all depends on their final proposal. Um, traffic impacts are anticipated to be minimal um, since it does have an existing single family residence um, and it is located within the existing neighborhood um, with similar uses. I'm sure you've all been seeing more of these coming around. Um, the proposed <coughs> apartment, as I said, would meet or exceed our setbacks. That would be confirmed a building permit. Um, it does allow for adequate open space within the subject property to maintain that character of the existing neighborhood. Um, it is a predominantly single family neighborhood um, and it's, this use is not expected to impact or change the character of that area. Um, so the city staff is recommending approval of the conditional use permit um, subject to 10 conditions that I attached in the staff report. Um, the planning board did meet on February 16th and considered the request. No members of the public spoke at that meeting um, and the minutes were attached as part of your packet. Um, following the hearing, the planning board did vote unanimously six to zero um, for approval and they appro um, adopted the staff findings of fact and the conditions of approval. So I can answer any questions if you have any. Thanks, Bailey. Any questions for Bailey? Richard. In the packet, there was mm -hmm. that question about um, a garage being shown on 6th, a garage door opening on 6th. Yes. Has that been resolved? What's, what eventually happened there? You had some question. Mm, yes, and I'm trying to remember what that was now. I forgot about that. Let me reread this minutes to remember. I'm sorry. Mm. Can you repeat that question, Richard? Sorry. Yeah, uh, on... Um, Page, I can get there. Um, looking for, yeah, I don't talk about it in the minutes. I don't remember what that, what the question was about that. It starts out, hey guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, 155. Was it 155 in? Thanks. Um, Sorry, the technology is. Oh, just my question about Yeah, it? you had this question. Uh, you're yeah. finishing your review. Um, yep. Yep. And uh, there's a corner lot, uh, and you said um, showing a garage door along the 6th Street side. Mm hmm. But they haven't shown a driveway. Yeah. Yeah. And that was where I just put a condition that if they do do the driveway, it would have to be the 35 feet from it. Okay. Which condition so number is that? That is condition number six. Okay. Yeah. So I, they could change their plan and end up getting rid of that garage door. Um, they haven't submitted their building permit yet, so I don't know what their final plan would be I would assume it's the same okay. that I have um, but thank you sorry about that further questions for Bailey not seeing any we did advertise for what will be item 6a of our agenda any public comment tonight on this item not seeing any I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and turn it back to the council for discussion or a motion Richard. I'll go ahead and make a motion uh, to approve WCUP 17-01 uh, and the findings of fact plus 10 conditions uh, as described in our packet. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that carries unanimously. Michelle, thanks, Billy. We'll move on to item 6B, which will be our own ordinance 17-9, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Whitefish rezoning approximately 8.6 acres of land located at 1180 Vorman Road in Section 5, Township 30 North, Range 21 West from County R3, which is their one family residential district to our equivalent Whitefish W 
R1 and adopting findings with respect to such rezone on a first reading. It's the Bailey Show tonight, so Good. you get me. That's for great. We haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as the mayor said, the city is requesting a zone change on two parcels from County R3, one family residential, to City WR1, one family residential. Um, the parcels are located along Borman and Monaghan Roads. They're now located within the city limits. They total approximately 8.6 acres. The purpose of rezoning the properties is due to the adoption of Resolution 1704, which annexed the properties into Whitefish City Limits on January 17th, and then Resolution 1707 on February 6th that corrected some typos. Um, since it's now within the city limits, we have to change the zoning from a county zone to a city zone. Um, there is a comparison of the WR1 zone and the county R3 zone. It's on page 172 of your packet if you wanted to, to look at them. Um, the properties are currently vacant. Um, it is identified as urban on our city county growth policy, and that does correspond to the WR1 and WR2 and WLR zones. Um, we did mail a notice to adjacent landowners within 150 feet on January 27th. Um, we noticed advisory agencies and also published um, a legal in the Whitefish pilot. Um, we've had no comments received at this time. Um, we did review the request in accordance with our criteria um, for purposes of rezoning. Um, I'll keep them brief since we've been going over these quite a number um, <coughs> this last time. Um, staff is recommending approval of the rezone. Um, the planning board met on February 16th and considered the request. No members of the public spoke at that time. Um, the draft minutes were attached as part of your packet. Um, and following the public hearing, the planning board did vote unanimous to recommend approval to the city council. Um, and I can go into more detail if you have questions, but I'm keeping them brief, so. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate that. Any questions for Bailey? Not seeing any. Thanks, Bailey. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing for what will be our own ordinance 17-9. Any public testimony this evening? Not seeing any. We'll turn it back to the council for discussion or a motion. Andy. I would move that we approve ordinance 17-09 on first reading. I'll second. That motion has been seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand, and those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously as well, Michelle. We will stay with Bailey and move on to Ordinance 17-10, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Whitefish rezoning approximately 8.2 acres of land comprised of six parcels in Section 31 and 32, Township 31 North, Range 21 West, from County R4, which is their two-family residential district, to our equivalent excuse me, and County R3, which is their one family residential district, to our equivalent Whitefish WR2 and WR1 in adopting findings with respect to such rezone. Okay, uh, so this is a request to rezone six parcels, as the mayor said, from County R4 and County R3 to City WR2 and City WR1. The parcels are located along Park Avenue and Creekview Drive and then the unimproved 10th Street right of way. Um, they all combined all total approximately 8.2 acres. Um, again, the purpose of rezoning is due to um, the annexation of the properties into Whitefish City Limits on January 17th. Um, and since it's now city property, we have to change the zoning. Um, there is a comparison between the, um, the county zones and the city zones on page 212 of your packet. Um, and I also tried to include the map that showed um, where the the different zones were going to go on which properties so hopefully that would made sense when i did that um the, let's see due to the growth policy identifies the parcels as urban um, again that does correspond to our wr1 and wr2 zones uh, we did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners on january 27th and placed um, and notice advisory agencies and placed the legal in the pilot um, we did have one comment um, submitted in written format um, that was concerned with development proposals. Again, there is no development proposal in conjunction with this, um, but that was their concern was that something was happening. Um, and then we did have one um, member of the public speak at the public hearing with the planning board, and that was their same concern, that they thought that there was a subdivision or something that might have been happening um, instead of just the rezone. Um, we did review it in accordance with the statutory criteria for purposes of rezoning within our regulations. Uh, skipping. 
Um, we are recommending approval of the rezone. Um, again, the planning board met on February 16th and considered the request. We had one member of the public speak. The draft minutes were attached as part of your packet. Um, and following the public hearing, the planning board did vote unanimous for approval as well. So. Thanks, Bailey. Questions for Bailey? Not seeing any. We did advertise for Ordinance 17-10. We will hear that public hearing now. Any public testimony tonight? Not seeing any, I'll turn it back to the council for a motion. Andy. I've already got practice with this one, so, but I'll just have to change the number. I would move that we approve ordinance 17-10 on a first reading. Is there a second to the motion? I second. Seconded by Councillor Williams. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that's again unanimous, Michelle. We'll move on to item 6D, which will be our own ordinance 17-11 an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Whitefish rezoning approximately 0 0.9 acres of land located along Ridgecrest Drive in Section 24, Township 31 North, Range 21 West from County RR1, which is their low density resort residential district to our equivalent Whitefish WRR1 and adopting findings with respect to such rezone. Okay, so as the mayor said, this is a zone change on one parcel from County RR1 to City WRR1. Uh, the parcel is located along Ridgecrest Drive. It is approximately 0.9 acres. Um, again, the purpose of rezoning is due to the annexation of the property on January 17th under Resolution 1704. Um, there is a comparison between the two zones on page 254 of your packet. Um, the growth policy does identify the parcel as resort residential, and that generally does correspond to our WRR1 and WRR2. We did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners on January 27th, um, notice advisory agencies, and placed the legal in the pilot on February 1st. We've had no comments received um, on this project. We did review the project, or excuse me, the rezone, in accordance with our criteria for rezoning of the property. Uh, staff is recommending approval of the rezone. Um, the planning board met on February 16th, considered the request. No members of the public spoke at that time, um, and I did attach the planning board minutes relating to this item to your packet. Um, following the public hearing, the planning board did vote unanimous um, to recommend approval to the city council. So, can you answer questions? Again. Thanks, Bailey. Any questions for Bailey? <clears throat> Not seeing any again. We did advertise for a public hearing, and we'll hold that public hearing now. Any public testimony tonight? Not seeing any. We'll turn it back to council for a motion. Andy. <laughs> I would move that we approve ordinance 17-11 on a first reading. I second. That motion was seconded by Councillor Williams. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that's again unanimous. Which brings us on to item 6E, which will be ordinance 17-12, rezoning approximately 8.4 acres of land located on Whitefish Lookout Road in section 12, Township 31 North, Range 22 West, from County RR1, which again is their low density resort residential district to our equivalent Whitefish WRR1, and adopting findings with respect to such rezone on a first reading. Okay, so this is a zone change on one parcel, um, also including the adjacent lookout road from County RR1 to City WRR1. Uh, the parcel is located adjacent to lookout road. Um, it is approximately 8.4 acres. Um, again, the purpose of rezoning the property was due to the annexation of the property on January 17th. Um, and since it's on the city, we have to rezone the property. Um, there is, a, again, a comparison between the county and the city zoning on page 293 of your packet. Um, the growth policy does identify this area as resort residential on our future land use map, um, and this generally does correspond to our um, WRR1 and WRR2 zoning. We did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners on January 27th, notice advisory agencies, and did place the legal in the paper on February 1st. Um, we've had no comments received on the project, um, and we reviewed it in accordance with our statutory, statutory criteria for rezones. Uh, the planning board met on February, oh, excuse me, I forgot. Staff is recommending approval of the requested rezone. 
Um, the planning board did meet on February 16th um, to consider the request. No members of the public spoke at that time. Um, the minutes are attached as part of your packet. Um, the planning board did vote unanimous for recommending approval to the city council as well. Thanks, Bailey. Any questions for Bailey? Not seeing any, we did advertise for what will be our own ordinance 17-12 for a public hearing. Any comments this evening on this item? Not seeing any, I'll close the public hearing and turn it back to the council for a motion. <laughs> I would go ahead and move to approve ordinance 17-12 on our first reading. Second. That motion was seconded by Councilor Williams and if it makes you feel any better, I think Frank was six for six at the last meeting. <laughs> Further comments on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that again carries unanimously. Which brings us to our last and final public hearing of the evening, which will be 17-13, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Whitefish to rezone approximately 4,200 square feet of land located along Colorado Avenue, uh, north of the intersection with Denver Street and Section 25, Township 31 North, Range 22 West, from County R4, which is their two-family residential district, to our WR3, which is our low-density multifamily residential district, and adopting findings with respect to such rezone. Okay, so this is a request for to rezone one parcel from County R4 to City WR3. Uh, the parcel is located along Colorado Avenue, and as the mayor said, it does um, total approximately 4,200 square feet. Uh, the purpose of rezoning the property is due to the annexation of the property on January 17th. Um, since it's now within the city, we have to rezone the property. Um, there is a comparison between the WR3 and the county R4 um, zoning district on page 331 of your packet. Uh, the growth policy does identify this area as high density residential, um, and that does correspond to our WR3 and WR4 zones. Um, some WR2 can be in there with a PUD option, but it does correspond to that area. Um, we did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners within 150 feet on January 27th and placed a legal in the paper on February 1st. Um, we had no public comments received on this project. Um, we did review the request in accordance with our statutory criteria for purposes of rezoning. And thank you. Staff is recommending approval of the project, of the proposed rezone. Um, the Whitefish Planning Board met on February 16th and considered the request. As I stated, no members of the public spoke at the public hearing and I did attach the draft minutes to your packet. Um, following the public hearing, the Planning Board did vote unanimous to recommend approval to the City Council. Answer questions. Questions? Not seeing any, we did advertise a public hearing for what will be Ordinance 17 13. Any public comment tonight? Not seeing any, I'll close the public hearing and turn it back to the council. Andy. One last time with feeling, I guess, huh? Um, ordinance uh, 17 13, I would move that we approve that on a first reading. I second. It was seconded by Councillor Williams. Further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand, and those opposed, like sign, and that's again unanimous, Michelle. Thanks, Bailey. Thank you. We will move on to item seven, which is communications from Craig Workman, our public works director, on what will be resolution 17-14, a resolution of the city council, authorizing the city manager to apply for an individual variance from base numeric nutrient criteria to the Montana Department of environmental quality related to our wastewater treatment plant upgrade. Craig. Thank you very much. I feel like I'm interrupting the Bailey show. <laughs> uh, well done, Bailey. Thank you for all of those fun reports. Um, I'm gonna direct you all to page 362 of your packet, which is where my staff report begins. Um, I think it's <clears throat> no surprise to the council that uh, DEQ uh, is the governing body of the state of Montana that's responsible for uh, putting together our water quality criteria. And this is the criteria that we are basing our um, new wastewater treatment plant on. Um, most of the, the criteria that DEQ puts together is numeric in nature. Um, and they do this so that essentially they can govern uh, the water quality of the receiving streams that all the wastewater treatment plants <clears throat> discharge to. 
Um, when Montana first put together numeric nutrient standards for uh, the state of Montana, um, DEQ did it by what they call eco-region. Um, and this was done in 2014. And whitefish, being in the northwest portion of the state, falls into what's called the Northern Rockies ecoregion. And it's the most um, restrictive <clears throat> of the regions that they have. Uh, in fact, the, the nitrogen and phosphorus limits for this region are um, significantly lower than the rest of the state. They're set at 0.275 milligrams per liter um, for nitrogen and 0 0.025 milligrams per liter uh, for phosphorus. And these levels are so low that they really can't be met by conventional wastewater treatment technology. So um, knowing that trying to treat down to these levels would uh, create a, a significant economic hardship for communities, um, they put together a, a variance process. Um, there is a ge general variance procedure that communities can go through. Uh, it was set after a very long and arduous uh, public process. Uh, the, the process involved not only DEQ and the EPA, but also many individual communities. Um, Whitefish was, was definitely one of them. John Wilson traveled to, to Helena on numerous occasions uh, over the course of about three years to try and put these variance procedures together. Um, when the procedures were adopted, um, whitefish was able to fall into a category with a less restrictive nitrogen and phosphorus limit. Um, and those came out in our last permit. In 2015, uh, the nitrogen limit was set at 10 milligrams per liter and the phosphorus limit at one milligram per liter. Um, these are described in the, the current administrative order on consent that we have, and these are the numbers that we used when we um, developed our preliminary engineering report, which recommended the sequencing batch reactor, which we're looking to move forward with out at the wastewater treatment plant. Well, fast forward to 2017. Um, the, the general variance uh, procedure does call for a, what they call a triennial review. So every three years, they basically go back and they look at the procedure and they make sure it still qualifies under EPA's rule. Since 2014, EPA uh, enacted a new federal code, which basically uh, made these variance procedures much more strict. And the preliminary indication to DEQ is that our current general variance procedure no longer meets EPA's requirements. Um, based on that, uh, we've essentially failed this triennial review, if you will, and so now DEQ is going back to the drawing board uh, to redo the general variance procedures. Um, instead of taking, you know, as much as three years as we did the last time, they're trying to get this done by July of this year. Um, this information came to, to the city in January, and so now we, we basically, from the, the second they said go, we've got about six months to completely redo this general variance procedure. Um, having attended about five meetings in the last two weeks of the nutrient work group and the subcommittee, uh, as recently as today in Helena, um, it's become pretty clear pretty quickly that these numbers are going to go way down. Uh, what we currently have uh, at 10 and 1 is likely going to be um, 7 and 0.1 uh, for our next variance. Uh, and then a couple years after that, it'll probably ratchet down to 3 and 0.05. Uh, knowing that's the case, we realize pretty quickly that the sequencing batch reactor that we're uh, looking to design won't be able to meet those criteria, and we're looking at upwards of another five to ten million dollars worth of improvements to try and reach those numbers. Yeah. So, enter into uh, what's called the individual variance. <laughs> Uh, Montana, allow, Montana law also allows for what are called individual variances, where EPA uh, or DEQ essentially will submit to EPA um, an individual variance for each community based on their individual criteria. Um, based on the, you know, the current load limits um, in Whitefish River and the current median household income that we have in Whitefish, DEQ has basically told us that um, we're a really good candidate for an individual variance. Um, and that individual variance would essentially set the limits at, at 10 and 1, where we currently are. Um, we've had several meetings with DEQ um, specifically talking about um, this, this indiv individual variance, and they have recommended essentially that, um, that we move forward in that direction, uh, knowing that there still will be a general variance option down the road, uh, but 
with the uncertainty of, of what those future limits are going to be, um, it is the recommendation of Public Works that we move forward and apply for this general variance. Um, essentially, what the general variance does is it reviews, um, first and foremost, the water quality in White, Whitefish River, which is our receiving water body. Um, knowing that we still need to produce wastewater that, um, that doesn't harm Whitefish River and ensures its future use, um, we'll go through a process where we basically establish those numbers. Uh, those numbers on preliminary indication at 10 and 1 are, um, are going to meet that need. And then the next thing we do is we go through and we individually um, characterize each of our wastewater rates um, and determine whether or not uh, we're spending essentially enough money on wastewater treatment to meet that individual economic variance. And again, DEQ does think that, uh, that we have uh, the preliminary indication uh, to meet that variance requirement. So um, with that in mind, there is a resolution in your packet, and I am recommending that Council adopt that resolution. That gives us kind of the go-ahead to begin the application, um, and uh, should all of the numbers uh, come out as we think they will, submit that to DEQ for that individual variance. Thanks, Craig. Any questions for Craig? Frank. <clears throat> Craig, I'm... I'm I know we're dealing with a lot of bureaucratic gobbledygook here, but I'm trying to sort through a problem that I had when I first read that, and that is, is anybody else in the Valley going to be able to meet these newer numbers, or, not, or is everybody else in the Valley going to be subject to requesting a variance? I'm thinking Kalispell with their wastewater system. Yeah, Kalispell um, currently has a mechanical wastewater treatment plant, um, and they have numbers that are more stringent than the numbers that, that we have in our permit um, right now. Um, there's definitely concern on their part that these new, uh, more restrictive uh, general variance numbers are going to be tough to meet. Um, they've talked about a number of different uh, solutions. Uh, to their individual problem when it comes to the general variance, one of which is to change their receiving body, um, okay. which would involve uh, quite a distance of additional uh, piping to get their, um, their effluent to a different receiving body. Um, but when you look at the, the dollars and cents to treat you know, your wastewater down to these restrictive numbers, projects like that, you know, that used to be super out of the box are now almost more conventional than trying to add on, you know, third and fourth stages to your wastewater plant that cost millions of dollars to, to install and, you know, millions more to, to operate over the years. What, and then what are the, how, assume this variance is granted, how long will it last for, will we have to renew it, what, I mean, what is that process? I mean. I mean, because we're going to create a brand new water treatment plant based on this variance, correct? Yeah, yeah that, that's correct. Um, the individual variances have the same triennial review process as the general variance. Um, we'll go through the same uh, process every three years where we basically look at uh, how much money we're spending on wastewater treatment and how that compares to the median household income of, of the city of Whitefish. Um, our initial projections is that this individual variance uh, will last us about 20 years. We think it'll be 20 years before the $17.5 million project um, will, uh, before median household income will, will exceed that $17.5 million expenditure. Okay. Richard. So do we have to come up with a new design, or is the batch reactor going to be able to meet these criteria? The batch reactor will be able to meet the, the criteria that we'll get in the, in the individual variance, the 10 and 1. Okay. Um, we think that initial indications, although we're early in the design, um, we'll probably be able to get down to, to 8 and 0.8 or so. Um, and so even if our individual um, variance limits go down a little bit, we'll still be okay. But likely 20 years from now, um, we'll be looking at, you know, adding something onto that wastewater plant. Is DEQ the sole reviewer of the individual variance request, or does it get kicked up to the EPA? Yeah, no, it still goes to EPA. EPA is really the final signatory body on, on any Denver? variance. Uh, yeah, Region 8, Denver. 
and so I know we were underway with final design and engineering. What's the re response time on this request? And are we going to be doing engineering that we're going to have to, you know, undo if they indeed deny this request? No, we've basically put a hold on the engineering okay. at this point, and DEQ is well aware of that. Um, Whitefish is, uh, I believe, the only um, municipality in Montana that's really kind of stuck in this catch-22 at this point, where literally we submitted the PER three months ago, right. um, and in the review comments of the PER is when this came to light. Um, and so... Uh, Although I think DEQ had some preliminary indications from EPA last fall that um, that the general variance uh, wasn't going to uh, be accepted by EPA, it didn't really come out until they were reviewing RPER. Okay. Uh, so that being said, e DEQ is well aware of the fact that this is likely going to extend um, our deadline. You know, we've spent the last um, eight weeks, you know, when we were supposed to be getting into heavy design, basically you know, attending nutrient work group meetings and talking to subcommittees and um, sort of forming our own uh, groups on, you know, trying and trying and figuring out how to, how to deal with this variance issue. So uh, what we'll essentially do is probably take the next, I'm going to say three or four months to complete the application, make sure that this variance is, is truly the right way to go. Um, submit that should it be the case and likely we're going to you know extend our, our wastewater plan out a year okay. thanks craig further questions for craig we will need a motion which will be on resolution 17-14 richard i'll go ahead and make a motion to approve resolution 17-14 um resolution of the city Council of the City of Whitefish, Montana, authorizing Whitefish, oops, sorry, I was in Legacy Partners, uh, <laughs> uh, authorizing City Manager to apply for an individual variance from base numeric nutrient criteria to the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. Is there a second to the motion? I second. Seconded by Councilor Williams. Further discussion? Thanks for being proactive on this, Craig. Much appreciated. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and the motion carries unanimously. Which brings us on to item eight, which is communications from Angie, our city attorney, and this will be resolution 17-15, a resolution of the city council of the city of Whitefish authorizing Whitefish Legacy Partners to submit an application for a trail easement to the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, and I will just identify Heidi has joined us tonight. She's, of course, the executive director of Whitefish Legacy Partners. So if we have any questions that uh, Angie wants to defer to um, Heidi, Heidi's here for our discussion. Angie. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, two weeks ago, um, Whitefish Legacy Partners presented at a work session on their campaign to close the loop of the Whitefish Trail. We currently have 36 six miles of trail and there are approximately 20 more trails or 20 more miles of trail before we can actually close the, the loop around the greater um, whitefish area um, as part of phase one whitefish legacy partners intends to construct the tail uh, the trail in the haskell basin conservation easement i think it's about 5.5 miles and as phase two, they would like um, to apply for an easement with um, DNRC for um, a trail to run through um, trust lands. And there is one, I'm not sure it's a typo, but I think Heidi might have remeasured the trail. In the resolution, it says 13.2. I think it's now 17.5. So we should probably make that um, change to the resolution. Um, and as, um, like I said, this is just an application for a trail easement to DNRC. The easement, um, as we do with other easements and licenses, will be held by the city. It will be constructed and managed um, in accordance with our memorandum of understanding with Whitefish Legacy Partners. They intend to apply for two federal grants in 2018 to fund the construction and um, purchase of the trail easement. And so with that, we do recommend that you approve um, the request to submit the application to DR, D, D, N, D, N, R, C. And if you have technical questions, Heidi would probably be the best person to answer them. 
Thanks, Angie. Any questions for Angie or Heidi for that matter? If you don't mind, would you just give us a, a brief overview? I know we identified this or discussed this at our last work session, but for the public that's watching tonight, just a Cliff Notes version of what this means in terms of close the loop, sure. if you don't mind. for considering the submittal of our application. Um, basically, the idea is we would like to connect the existing trail that's out at um, Beaver Lake's north connection. There's a sort of a small trailhead and parking area there, and the trail corridor um, would continue on state trust lands down to the railroad tracks, and then um, we have to partner with Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad to build a bridge across the railroad. Um, and once we get their support in that, then um, we'll be back on state trust land and we'll be in the Swift Creek subunit. And um, the trail then will um, go um, on an old road. There's a, a lot of descriptive um, information in our application, but there's combination of old road and um, road to trail conversion as well as new trail construction. And, um, and then the trail will have to go across um, Lazy Creek and there'll be a section of boardwalk interspersed with um, raised gravel and more boardwalk um, to get to Swift Creek. Um, and then across Swift Creek and we'll join into our existing trailhead um, at the Swift Creek area. And there'll be a loop um, out there to sort of expand that northern area a little bit just so that, you know, as we expand this trail, we want to make sure that we're giving users um, the opportunity to do things close into the trailhead as well as connect out into the larger landscape all in the front country, kind of tight into the whitefish community, but still circling around the lake. Um, and then um, the, the discrepancy with the mileage, um, at first our proposal was looking at just turning in um, an application for 13.2, which would miles of trail, which would be just for the close the loop. What we decided is in this proposal, we better put out there, besides this primary corridor of trail, also secondary and alternative routes. Because in this area, it is a very challenging um, landscape, both, both in the terrain and the different um, private partnerships that we'll have to um, negotiate to allow the trail to go through. So we have included um, some secondary routes if opportunities arise, and we've also included alternate routes in case we can't get across private property. Um, we do have a longer route that will keep us on state trust lands and forest service the entire way to make the connection. Um, so, you know, through the MEPA process that the DNRC will initiate once we um, submit our proposal, um, there'll be a whole public process that will last somewhere in between six months and a year um, to determine, you know, if what we're proposing makes sense um, for all the different reasons on the landscape, for the beneficiaries, for the wildlife, for the streams, all, all of those things will need to be considered. Um, and the DNRC will pursue that MEPA process um, and we will be a partner in that. Um, and from the Swift Creek Trailhead, we're also hoping to connect over um, to Smith Lake, where the trail goes currently, but also provide another route and then continue on to connect to the Forest Service, um, both with an alternate route um, through Taylor Hell Roaring, as well as sort of a more direct route um, connecting to Hell Roaring Basin and back to the Forest Service property on the Holbrook Overlook. So it's a pretty... Um, you know, it's a big area in terms of mileages of trail to get us around and connect to the Forest Service and bring us back to Haskell Basin. So it'll be something that's out in the public a lot in the next, um, you know, in 2017 as the DNRC reviews it and puts things out to the public. So you'll be hearing a lot more about it and this proposal is really just initiating that effort to consider it. Great, thanks very much, Heidi. Yep. Any questions for Heidi while she's here? Craig. I have a, just a quick question. I've been uh, working with Alan um, from Legacy Partners just, you know, just in the last couple of weeks since the, uh, the work session looking at the Reservoir Road trailhead. Um, and we noted, Alan and I, um, that council hasn't really taken any, taken any formal action on that Reservoir Road trailhead other than um, acknowledging the... Um, the land, the boundary line yeah, adjustment the Mer, on the MERS property. The, the MER property boundary line adjustment. 
So I was actually planning to come back to council at the next meeting um, for a formal kind of approval of, of the um, improvements on our property at Reservoir Road. If we're making a change to this resolution, would it be the appropriate place maybe just to have a, a section authorizing that trailhead as well, or should that be a separate resolution? I think the important piece is that as we apply for these grants, we need to secure that trail or that area will be committed in perpetuity for a trailhead and the trail corridor. So I don't know, I mean, my thought was another resolution that really permanently sort of determine, you know, recognizes that that's what that land will be used for. Um, and I know that <clears throat> that plan's ultimately gonna come to council for review and approval. Would it make sense just to have one resolution adopt or dedicating that? city parcel as a city trailhead and at the same time adopting the plan and that's fine i just know that you guys were planning to go out to rfp on that in the next week or two and yeah. so there was definitely some urgency there i do think mm -hmm. it needs to come to council at the next meeting but i guess i'd like to see it all as one because this is really all on state lands okay. and sort of the um ability to submit the application knowing that we'll come back with all these final things so it, if that's okay, I'd like to see that um, in the next, uh, as a whole set piece with the trailhead and the trail corridor. Ultimately. So we can, we can just conceptually approve the trailhead design at the next meeting as well, right? Uh, that's right, yeah. because okay. I think that, you know, the things that we yeah. pr presented at the work counts or at the um, work session was this application in draft form, and then we also presented that trail plan. Um, so having that be sort of a, a formal resolution that comes back to at your next meeting would be great. Okay. There's another big partner in the room, Dan. I just wanted to thank Winter Sports Incorporated and, and you in particular for your help in securing what will hopefully be the trailhead off Big Mountain Road and your commitment to making sure some form and fashion of this trail system's a reality. So I know you guys are a big player and we certainly appreciate it. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, with that said, we will need a motion for resolution 17-15. I move to approve resolution 17-15, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Whitefish authorizing Whitefish Legacy Partners to submit an application for a trail easement to the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation with the text amendment on page 367 of changing the uh, amount to 17.5 miles of state trust lands instead of 13.2 miles. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously. Michelle. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Heidi. We'll move on to item 9A. You have Adam's written report and close with the packet. Any questions uh, for Adam from the council? Adam, anything additional to report on? Yeah, I d <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware that the RFP did go out from the Chamber of Commerce on the affordable housing. So I, their goal is to, uh, I think they're due by uh, beginning of April and then towards the end of April, they wanna secure a contractor. So we should have things in full swing by the end of April. So. Hopefully that'll go really well for us. Great, thanks Adam. We'll move on to item 10. Uh, we have, I think we do this every election cycle, uh, consideration of uh, doing mail-in ballots versus polling places for the 2015 municipal elections. We'll need a motion and a showing of hands uh, regarding your preference of whether we do mail-in ballots versus polling and you have the cost estimates in the packet uh, comparing the two options, or at least the, the direct mailer option. Ms. Oh. Richard. <clears throat> I, just experience tells us, at least here in Whitefish, that um, our voter turnout is much, much higher and we have better participation when we have mail-in ballots. And I would suggest that um, that's the direction we should um, head. And with that, I would you need a motion to Please. approve, approve um, uh, mail-in ballots for the upcoming um, primary if we need it and for the general election. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. 
Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Oppose, like, sign, and that's unanimous as well, Michelle. And we'll move on to, we did receive, yes, sir. Not a point of order. Question, and maybe Angie can answer this point. Um, we've made it a policy around here for a number of cycles to primarily use or to, to go with the option of mail-in ballots. Um, and we do it every couple of years. Is there a way that we can um, approve by resolution or otherwise um, that the city of Whitefish, for its purposes, when we're doing municipal elections, will do them uh, primarily by uh, mail-in ballots so we don't have to do this uh, routine of deciding whether we're going to do this every couple of years. Yeah, I don't see a problem with that. I would, then I would request that we get such a resolution brought to the council and, and that we get that issue just to, to stop this cycle as sure. much as anything else and to make it permanent. I'd Thank be you. happy to draft one. Just a quick showing of hands with the council members here support that. Thanks, Ange. Thanks, Frank. We did receive a letter from the Anaconda Coalition for Tolerance Education regarding our proclamation and I guess just acknowledging and thanking uh, the City Council and the City for um, our proclamation. Um, I'd be happy to send a letter thanking them for their Please. thank you and their proclamation. Please do. Okay. On that note, we will start with communications from the City Councilors. I was hoping that uh, Maria and Mike Copel would be back by now. They both had to cut out for other business, but we do have the ongoing task of deciding how we're going to handle our uh, AIS program this summer. So, John, but, Marie's actually on her way. Is she? Okay. She's, she's and we'll just start with regular council comments, try to kill a few minutes, and uh, wait for, <laughs> for Angie to, or to <laughs> Maria to show up. Uh, Richard, would you like to start? <laughs> oh, I'd love to. Uh, uh, is this because I have a reputation for killing minutes? I don't know. Um, no, I, I think that we, um, I think everyone in the state and certainly anyone who has anything to do with Whitefish Lake recognizes the importance of um, Whitefish Lake and the watershed that adjoins it uh, and the threats posed by uh, AIS, aquatic invasive species. And I think that we, it's incumbent upon us to do everything we possibly can to uh, forestall the introduction of aquatic and invasive species, aquatic invasive species uh, into our watershed. And to that, I think that um, the plans that um, Maria, uh, along with uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and that, uh, I mean, I'm really pleased to see them step up, uh, particularly with um, the uh, uh, the boat landing um, at um, West, what do we call that boat landing? Um, at State Park, excuse me, the State Park boat landing. I, I think that uh, those go a long way um, to address the issue. Thanks, you're gonna have to repeat all that one. <laughs> to I know, get here. How, how many minutes did I use up? <laughs> that was good. Katie. <laughs> I have zero counselor comment. Okay. Frank. <clears throat> um, Michelle, help direct me here on what we need, what you need from us. I'm going to talk a little bit of one of the requests that I've got for the council is that we do whatever we need to do uh, through either some formal motion or otherwise to proceed with the consolidation of our animal licensing, dog licensing uh, with the county. There's no reason, I think we took a step maybe two years ago or a year and a half ago suggesting that whatever we could do to make this a county-wide problem, let's just do that. Um, there apparently been some hiccups in the interim uh, with, uh, for various reasons and I'm now informed that we need some kind of reportedly motion conversation at the council level to again renew or re reinitiate that. Now, have I done what we need to do? As long as the <laughs> other counselors agree with you. So my request is, do, does anybody have an opposition to that or is there a better way? Any opposition or support to approach Flathead County for joint dog licensing? We've addressed this before to no avail. I think we give it another try. Okay. 
Thanks, Michelle. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I'm going to try to hold off just a few minutes for Mike to arrive as well. He indicated he was coming back. So maybe what we can do until Mike arrives is since this will be a city um, ordinance, you have a model ordinance that Angie and Maria uh, worked on uh, related to establishing an AIS prevention program. So perhaps if counselors have comments, questions on the model ordinance, we can, we can be begin with that item. I know I have a couple, <clears throat> couple questions myself. I will start then. Um, on page, the bottom of page two, which is under section 13-5-4, watercraft inspections and decontamination. Um, you know, we identified that the city can appoint agents or city personnel to inspect watercraft prior to launching. Um, any watercraft that's found with indications of AIS shall be required to undergo decontamination procedures or quarantine prior to launch. <clears throat> we require, or we can require online certification, et cetera. You have the language in front of you. Do we need to add language specifically targeting ballast tanks? Or is this adequate? Um, actually, John, we handle that. Maybe. Under definitions. So if you go to prohibitions, um, no person shall launch any high risk watercraft into Whitefish Lake without first having the watercraft decontaminated. Um, mm -hmm. And we identify high, okay. high risk watercraft as including but not limited to ballast boats or Great. boats with ballast bags or interior water holding compartments. So in 13-5-3-E. So we are requiring a mandatory decontamination of ballast boats unless they can provide proof that the watercraft wasn't launched in any body of water for the preceding six months. And that would cover instances where it sat in storage for six months. Okay. <clears throat> and then we define high risk watercraft at the top under section 13-5-2-C. Correct. Where does that definition come from? Anybody know? It actually was provided by Whitefish Lake Institute. Okay. I asked this of Maria today, or at least <clears throat> during our meetings last week with um, the directors that Adam and I participated, and uh, both Judge Johnson as well as Chief Dial, and I know Maria's addressed this, but maybe just for my edification, there was some concern about, you know, how are the tickets gonna be issued down at City Beach, you know, the authority provided to the beach rangers, and then more importantly, from the judge's perspective, and I think Chief Dials, how would those tickets be entered into their system? And I know Maria's addressed this, and I just would like to hear a little bit about that. Uh, we held a meeting with Christy Curtis and um, Bridger Kelch and um, Carla and Chuck Stearns, Carla Velsky, Chuck Stearns, and we discussed um, civil citations not only out at City Beach but also at the, um, the City Hall uh, parking structure. Um, and really any citation that is issued, civil citation that's issued at City Beach can be administered at the um, court the same as any um, ticket would be issued. Uh, what we do need to figure out is more parking tickets um, at City Hall. We're still meeting to determine how we're going to manage that. But a civil citation at City Beach will, will be handled just the same as uh, any um, regular ticket would be handled as if a police officer handed it, 
to an individual. The okay. court can process it just the same. Great. Yep. Thanks. Thanks for handling that. Mike, we're on to the discussion regarding AIS. We're just um, reviewing before you arrived. Just We started reviewing the draft model ordinance, and there was a couple questions on, or I had asked the question about ballast tank mandatory decontamination. They pointed me to where that's addressed um, in the ordinance. Um, with that said, I guess, I know Maria has reviewed this and you're obviously comfortable with it. Mike, do you have any comments? Um, you're okay with it? Okay. Further comments on this from the council? Angie. Just one more thing to add, John, that I didn't add in this draft, but I intend it to be in the final um, draft of the ordinance, is an additional, additional prohibition against launching at City Beach outside of the open hours of the boat launch. Okay, so that'll be added in for the first reading? It will. Okay, which comes to us next meeting, correct? It should come to us next meeting, yes. So if we're on time, it'll be in effect May 17th? Should be effect May 17th, yeah. Okay, great. Does the civil citation fit with our fee schedules, fine schedules? Is that what it's based on, Maria? It would be the same as um, any, there's a limit to the civil citation. I think it's $300 for a civil citation and 500 for criminal. So it would fit within the $300 limit that we have within our code. Okay, but, and, but will, we, will we establish first and second offense fine? Schedule. That would be established through the court, and they would be keeping record of if it was a first, second offense, and then the judge would determine if that fine increases based on if it's a reoccurrence okay. or not. So as a follow-up to our, um, well, first of all, Andy, did you have any other counselor comments tonight? Oh, Before, okay. So as a follow-up to our, our work session, we, you know, because of the urgency to have something you know, in place by May 1st, we do need to provide, you know, direction to both Maria and staff uh, this evening. And again, wanted to thank Mike and Maria for working on this uh, cooperatively. Um, and please help me walk through this, Maria and Mike, if um, we need to address this differently. But it seems as though we could kind of break this down this evening based on this, these list of uh, budget items in tasks that identify the FY17 needs as well as the FY18 needs, because obviously what we decide tonight will affect um, both uh, budgets. And so I'll go ahead and start with um, the FY17 items, which are deadline specific for May 1, which um, includes City Beach. So um, as Maria and Mike um, indicated today, that would include extending the boat launch hours with the use of beach rangers from May 1st through June 30th, starting at 5 a.m. Um, through 9 p.m. Uh, Sunday through Saturday. Um, as Maria, uh, it would also include supplies for the inspection station, uh, signage, uh, chain installation, as well as uh, the time put into crafting the ordinance. Um, as Maria indicated, and correct me if I'm wrong, Maria, but this would generally have no impact on the FY17 um, budget. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So we would not have to request um, any additional uh, budget amendment from the council. And so that's the first item we need uh, to discuss. Do you want to take these item by item, or do you want to review all four and then make um, one motion? depending on how you want to guide this? Or am I not being clear? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was having a hard time. When you say all four, I'm, what are you, we're going well, to- Well, we have, we have the decision we need to make on whether we're going to staff City right. Beach through June 30th, yes. whether we're going to staff State Park through June 30th as well. And then for the FY18 items, uh, whether we're going to fund the City Beach um, inspection um, okay. and then state park as well for FY18. So that's kind of the direction I was heading. But if you have a better idea, no, no, certainly go great. for it. That's great. Um, so do we want to go through each of these line by line and then have an open discussion? Great. Okay. So again, the second would be uh, state park uh, funding for FY17, which would be again May 1st through June 30th, staffing from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, this would possibly require a budget amendment um, if we were to redirect um, 
cash reserves from the parks department, or a second option would be uh, to direct uh, funding from the water utility, which I understand would not require a budget amendment. Is that correct, Adam? Just through the end of 17. That's right. Okay. So that's the second item, whether or not to, to fund State Park uh, through June 30th. Moving on to FY18, which starts July 1, again, uh, continuing the same program at City Beach, which according to Maria really has no impact uh, to her budget, you know, given the reductions in the number of lifeguards, et cetera. And then secondly, uh, if we want to fund uh, State Park, it looks as though that total cost would be about 44470 uh, Mike indicated there's a $18,000 DNRC grant that we've been awarded or the Institute has been awarded with the city. And so that balance of $26,000 um, could be funded through the blending of sources, which would include that grant, plus pop, prop, possibly property taxes, as well as a portion from uh, the water utility fund. And that would obviously have to be discussed during our um, budget cycle and discussions with Adam. And then the last item, of course, that I didn't mention is the decontamination station. You know, Mike's made the request that um, the city, you know, kind of in a backup role, uh, provide tentative funding uh, to staff uh, that position in the event that they don't come up with um, funding through other sources. So that's kind of the overview. Uh, Maria, if I missed anything, please chime in. <laughs> Mike, Sam. Frank. Mr. Mayor, I mean, I'll take a, a shot at this. I would, I would move that we approve all of these requests um, uh, my caveat to that is with respect to State Park for t uh, fiscal year 17, that we direct that, that that be funded through the water fund for this year um, because we can and we have the available funds there and it wouldn't require a budget amendment. Um, the last, and then with respect to fiscal year 18, um, it would be my preference that we, um, we enter into a set of discussions that would provide funding through both the water fund and maybe some uh, increases in the tax supported fund of the parks department. So we don't have to, I don't know that we need to make that decision now. I think the commitment from this council might ought to be that we're going to do that. I don't know that we can, I'm happy to have a discussion as to where the best way to do that is. Mm -hmm. um, but, so that's my thought on it. Was that a motion? Yes, or? it is. Okay. If you, if you wanted a discussion or a motion, that would be my motion. Okay. So let me just, Go ahead. Restate that, okay. if that's okay, just for the record. So you're motioning to um, approve the FY uh, 17 items and that the state park funding uh, be paid for through uh, the water utility fund. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, that we're committing to the FY 18 items, which would include staffing of City Beach um, and state park uh, sources of funding to be determined during the budget cycle. Yes. For FY18. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second and then I may have a friendly amendment. Sure. And I would amend that to include um, a authorize the city to uh, underwrite the decontamination station should um, Whitefish, Whitefish Lake Institute. Uh, not secure sufficient funding. Is there a second to the friendly amendment? Yeah, that we, the city, um, underwrite a decontamination station uh, should the Whitefish Lake Institute uh, be unable to secure sufficient um, funding. Like that friendly amendment fails for lack. For Frank? Also, I'll second. Yeah. Seconded for discussion. Yeah, for, for, certainly for discussion purposes. Um, I don't think, well, the, the request I, I heard from the Institute was that we, they essentially needed us to float the uh, um, sickly wages that are being required to staff that thing for 
purposes of this summer. Um, and it wasn't, I, I don't know that, so to the extent we're going to approve this, I think we need to understand or describe that what the request really has been. It's not that we fully support or underwrite it totally, it is simply that we provide the, the float so that they can staff this thing on a, uh, the basis that they proposed for the summer, knowing that their income that will be generated from that station, its other funding, may not be quite as regular as the occurrence of the, uh, uh, of the wages that are required to staff it. So I'm not sure we're trying to underwrite it completely, and I don't want to, we're not writing an open check here based on that request. Um, I'm happy to support this under those circumstances. Katie. Are you uh, talking about the contingency fund of, I think it was of $7,500? Is that what you're indicating? I think that's right. Is that the correct? Mike, is that the correct number? So, yeah, based on your question. Name, uh, name and address, please. Uh, sorry, Mike Copel, uh, Whitefish Lake Institute, 550 East First Street, Whitefish. Um, based on your questions, uh, during the work session, I went back to the office and, and uh, found in the budget um, two items that need your attention. Attention. One was, I think Frank asked me, you know, what, what does this mean? How much uh, more money? And uh, the first is through uh, education and outreach. Now that Lori's uh, completed the uh, communications plan, uh, that budget, based on her uh, estimates, has increased by 6,000. And so that would be a consideration for fiscal year 17, uh, so that we could produce those educational outreach materials. What's that dollar amount? 6,000. And then the second line item would be basically however you want to label it. Um, I, I look at it as, as kind of an insurance policy. Should we not be able to uh, provide cost for staffing the decontamination station? And what I did just through uh, a budget exercise was to give the, the total budget a 5% contingency fee, which came out to 11,220, but that's really neither here nor there. Uh, we just don't know what the actual cost may be. You know, we're just making some assumptions here in the first year of the program. And that cost would be through the end of this season, correct? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I don't know if I answered your, your question or not, John. Mr. Mayor. It was, I think, Richard's question. Yeah, and well, my, my amendment would deal with what I thought was going to be $7,800 and is now eleven two twenty. Okay. So uh, was based on the information we had at the work session, um, my amendment still stands, uh, but hopefully, number one, it won't be that much, and number two, you'll be able to cover yep. that amount. Correct. Yep. I did not deal with the... Uh, EAO 6000 in FY17. We'd have to address that through a second yes, amendment, but let's focus on this first one. And I'd like to ask Angie um, a few questions. Obviously, if the council elects to help fund the decontamination station, uh, which would be, would that be that 11220? Is that for FY17 or just? Is that May through June 30th as well as July 1 through? I don't see a need for it until after the beginning of the new fiscal year. So fiscal July year 1. 18. Okay. I assume we would not be staffing that. We would be providing the funding, correct? That's the way I understand it is we wouldn't have city employees working with equipment we don't own on the property we don't own, but it would just be providing them reimbursement for um, their own employees' salaries. That's how I understand their proposal. Is there any liability the city would inherit as a result of providing funding for that, given that imagine. they're operating equipment and? No, not if we're just reimbursing them for their own employees' fees. Um, one of my primary concerns with the decontamination station as a whole is, you know, having city employees work on equipment we don't own on property we don't own, and you know. After this season, maybe we take a look at the decontamination station and how that's operating and decide what we want to do. But I don't see any liability just by reimbursing Whitefish Lake Institute for their own employees' okay. salaries. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm going to call on, on Adam and you're probably going <laughs> to state what I was going to, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. Hard part is I'm sitting here. I know I'm new. How much do I speak up? How bold do I be? <laughs> um, but I want, want to make sure that, you know, again, whatever is decided um, will be great. Staff will make it work. <clears throat> but I want to make sure that the council understands that city staff and everyone that has worked on this um, is unanimous, unanimous in the belief that we could do this with one inspection station at City Beach, that we do not need the second one. And as we've learned tonight, if we do that, it'll be budget neutral. We don't have to worry about tapping into the ratepayers pockets in order to make this work. Um, and I also want to point out too that every boat will be inspected with just one station. By adding the second station at State Park Road, or sta at the State Park, you don't inspect any more boats. So we can inspect all the boats for budget neutral, or we can still inspect all the boats for an additional 45 plus maybe floating money. Either way, we're inspecting all the boats. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what the issue is here, do we want to add the second inspection station for the convenience of the boaters? That's really what's happening. Because we're still gonna inspect all the boats, they just may come down. And so for convenience, I mean, they may have to go from State Park down to City Beach or directly to the decontamination station, which may more likely be the case depending on the boat and this, that, and the other. Um, <clears throat> but is it, it is of the belief that staff can handle all of it down at City Beach. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows what the staff mm -hmm. recommendation is. The fact that in either scenario, all boats will be inspected. So I would say that, hey, if State Park really did much better at protecting the lake, then that would be great. But it doesn't do any more, doesn't do any better protecting the lake. All boats will be inspected <coughs> before the into the lake, at least for those two. Now we see in some of our notes from earlier, there's several launch points that, you know, that aren't you know, owned by us or the state park um, that could be an issue down the road. But I just wanted to make sure that that was known. So, and then, you know, one of the things that I, that I also worry about is, you know, when we decided to build the parking structure, we did a lot of analysis to see if we really needed the parking structure and what size and everything else. We didn't just say, hey, it's congested downtown. Let's build a parking structure. Um, the other thing is if you know, we build it out there, once there's the expectation established, it's going to be tough to pull back if we ever wanted to. And so one of the things you're going to hear me harp on as we go through the budget and everything else is going to be sustainability. Um, there are. There are three things that I'm gonna harp on through the budget and every time we talk about finances. And one is covering unfunded liabilities. One is handling um, um, uh, savings. Uh, and we, we need to work on that. We're only at 11.6%. Um, and so that and unfunded liabilities and uh, now I'm drawing a blank. O&M and capital improvements. <laughs> capital improvement. We need to be able to make sure that we can steadily fund our capital improvement program. So I think, you know, with those kind of three things in mind, I, I'd like to urge the council to, to make decisions moving forward based upon improving uh, those three things. But those are just some of my thoughts on it. But either way, we'll, staff will respond. Angie and then Frank. Um, just one more consideration is, you know, Maria's a spreadsheet on you price on State Park. She has MOU with the state. Um, I have to say Dave Bennett's and Dave Lundstrom have been incredible to work with. They, um, they're not required to do what they're doing to help the city, but I think an MOU with the state itself is going to take some time. And that's just another consideration. It's not call up the state and you have an MOU the next day. It's going to have to go up their chain of command. I'm not saying that we couldn't operate that without an MOU, but it's another practical consideration. It's going to take, I think, you know, as far as the state works, some significant time to do it. And we're, like I said, we're lucky Dave and Dave bought into this and, you know, we're, I think, doing the right thing. So just another additional consideration when you consider the second inspection station. Okay. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up real quickly? Carry on. Um, and this is a question for you, Mike. So it is staff's recommendation that, that to not fund two inspection stations and kind of the rationale, Maria, correct me if I'm wrong, is that ultimately any boat that attempts to launch at State Park, if they're not sealed, they will be turned away or if they're suspected of, well, bottom line, if they're not sealed, they're not allowed to launch and they're redirected to the city 
facilities down at City Beach for a formal inspection, and then if they're a ballast tank, then they go to the decontamination station. So in essence, what Adam described is accurate, that ultimately all boats would ultimately receive an inspection just at one location uh, versus two. I know your concern has also been uh, related to congestion and traffic at, at the City Beach boat launch, yet both Carla and Maria have indicated that they're not overly concerned with that, particularly when you look at the state program, which is basically now establishing um, inspection stations at all of the major you know, highways entering Flathead Valley. So in theory, we should see a lower number of vesicles requir vessels requiring inspection. And that's been staff's uh, rationale to Adam's point regarding the finances. He's also you know, spot on. And as we'll see in the budget cycle, we have every department coming forward this year with staffing requests. And ultimately, all this boils down to is property tax increases in part to help fund all the demands on our government. So can you respond to that? And I know you probably have a contrary opinion to staff, and I think that's healthy, but I think it's important for us to hear from you as well. Sure. Well, we're definitely willing partners no matter what you decide. But I think if you, if you go down that road, you're going to assume a level of risk, a level of program risk. Um, first of all, we don't know exactly what the state's plan looks like. So they're talking about a SEAL program talking about increased inspection stations at the borders and along the Continental Divide. But not, none of that's been formalized to this point, so that's an assumption. Um, we're also making some assumptions uh, on uh, the amount of watercraft going through City Beach. We just don't have the data at, at this point. We have some user data from the last couple of years, years from Memorial Day to Labor Day, but we don't have anything from uh, State Park. All we know is they have approximately uh, 100,000 visitors, and of that we don't know how many are, are boats. So either way, whatever decision you make, you're, you're making some assumptions, um, and I just wanted to point that out. You know, this is the first year of a, a complex program, and so I, I'd hate to see it really uh, decrease the user experience when we're trying to foster and implement uh, this program, and ultimately, the program will only be as good as the weakest link. And so, for instance, if the state does approve a, a SEAL program, um, we still have a single lane at City Beach. And we might have a number of boats with SEALs, but if we have some in line that need an inspection, uh, the boats behind them, even though they have a SEAL, are going to be waiting in line. So there is that potential bottleneck effect at, at City Beach. And so, I'd, you know, I'd, I just caution that you know that could provide a, a negative user experience uh, for people recreate on, uh, recreating on Whitefish Lake, and that might have some economic uh, perspectives that you might want to uh, consider. Um, when I was back at the office, based on the work session, I I thought, well, maybe maybe we could compromise on this issue, and so um, you know maybe it's something where we funnel everybody through uh, City Beach in May during the the slow period, and then, then we ramp up uh, State Park, you know, June 1st to August 15th during peak use, and then we go back to just City Beach for the remainder of the, the boating season. So um, that would still require State Park's cooperation, um, and, uh, you know, I think I, you need to be aware of that because if, 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 they, if people can't uh, get inspected at State Park, you know, people over there, their, their uh, hosts are going to be turning around people to go to City Beach. Um, and then other than that, you know, if, if that sort of compromise was amenable, um, there would just be some communications and messaging um, difficulties we'd have to overcome, but I think we could do that through the communications plan. So those are just my thoughts on it, but um, we'll, we'll support whatever decision you make on that issue. Any follow-up? No. Okay. I guess the only thing that I would say is um, I'm, I'm always willing to compromise. My, my thought is, though, that during May and June, that was my 
belief of when we would probably see the most amount of seals because boats are coming out. Uh, they haven't been sealed yet. Um, I'm sorry, it'd be the time that we see the most amount of is inspections because no one has the seal yet. They haven't been, we haven't put, been putting it on as you're leaving the lake. Um, ballast boats haven't been decontaminated, so I actually see the May and June as probably being fairly busy times. And I anticipated that actually when it was our tourist season, it would slow down because if they were going through the state inspection, they're traveling from a distance, they're going through state inspection, they have a seal at that time. So I'm anticipating it might be busier May or June, but again, we don't have any, uh, we haven't been through it yet, so we just don't really know. They're all assumptions, like Mike said. Katie. <clears throat> At the state park level, if we weren't to fund another AIS station, who would be responsible for reapplying the seal once someone who came through, their boat was sealed, and then we need to go back, I'm taking my boat out, I'm going home for the day at eight o'clock, who's gonna apply the seal so that I can go back out without having to go through the inspection? We would have to, I, I don't have confirmation from state park if they would reapply the seals. They will inspect the seals. I'm assuming that they would reapply them as they came out, but they would only to be able to do that when they were staffing it. And they're not always, um, they don't have people always at their boat launch. They have people at the, the host um, shed, hut. Would it, <laughs> shed. Would it have, so then would they, they would be inspecting at the host shed, correct? Yes, that's where the, that's where the seals would be inspected at that time. Okay. Yeah. Richard. Then that brings up the 4th of July issue. If City Beach, nobody can launch City Beach on the 4th of July. Currently. That's a big boat day. I think that's probably more of a policy decision than really specific to our AAS program. But I think we'd have to deal with it. I see Angela's got her Angie. So, Murray, would we still inspect on the 4th of July at City Beach, even though we're not allowing them to launch at City Beach? Like John said, it would, it would be a policy decision if we felt that that was needed and necessary. I'm sure we could implement something for that day in particular. That, it, that day is pretty chaotic no matter what, so wherever we're doing it, it's, you know, it's going to be congestion. We know that <laughs> already. I'm going to bring us back to the friendly <clears throat> amendment, which was to provide alternative uh, funding, I believe, in the amount of plus or minus $11,220 for FY18 to help uh, fund the decontamination station. Is there any further comment on that friendly amendment? We'll vote on that first. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that motion passes on a three to one vote with Councillor Hildner voting against the amendment. Yeah, I, can I explain why I did that? I mean, Absolutely. I, I really think that I, I'm really trying to reconsider uh, what our city manager said. And uh, I think that uh, um, maybe we ought to really be taking a look at you know, making sure that all boats are inspected at a reasonable cost. Okay. Frank. May I? Yes. Um, I got to say, I feel a little bit like I've been uh, uh, bushwhacked. Um, I was not under the impression when I made my motion, Adam, um, not that I'm going to take it back, by the way, um, that there was a way to inspect all boats by just having City Beach. Uh, and so I feel a little bit misled. Um, I still don't see, notwithstanding um, Adam's budgetary concerns, and I, I share them, this issue is a bet your city and bet your community issue. We don't have any options here, gentlemen and ladies. I don't see how we don't take the opportunity, certainly in the first year, to understand the depth of the problem and how it's going to be otherwise dealt with. I mean, we're guessing here. Um, my, what I would suspect is if we only have one area to inspect all of these boats, 
given the number that I perceive go through uh, State Park, if they have to also cycle through uh, City Beach, that's going to be a mess that you've never seen and this city will not, I mean, it'll be a mess down there. Everybody in that neighborhood will be going nuts because they'll have boats backed up all over the place. I think we need to make the commitment for this year to have the two inspection points. If we determine through the data we will gather this year and, um, and the state's continued program for EIS, that maybe we don't need that. Maybe we don't. But we don't know that now. And what I think we're buying is we're buying an opportunity for people to avoid compliance based on providing uh, a pinch point that's going to require what I would guess would be some not insignificant uh, hold and wait times and congestion. And I think we're, we're buying a problem that we don't need to at this stage. I'm happy to have a discussion as to whether or not, given our experience in this summer season, whether we go forward with funding two inspection points on an ongoing basis. I think once does not create a precedent that we always do it. Um, I think we deal with this on, um, we deal with it based on the facts that we have, the threat that isn't presented to us, and what we, understanding that we don't know everything yet. Um, but I'm, I am very concerned about our, uh, again, going to a, a single pinch point for all inspections before anybody can get into that lake. Because as I said, what will happen, as I'm afraid, is people will find other places where they don't have to get inspected or where they can avoid inspection, just simply to avoid the whole idea that I'm gonna have to sit in line. Um, I just, I think we would be, I think we'd be fraught with some peril. And I'm, um, I think we need to spend the money this year uh, and commit to spend the money this year to fund that other spot. Um, just for our own uh, peace of mind uh, that we're doing what, can, what we know would work and could possibly reduce the risk um, of having one of these invasive species arrive in our lake. I mean, I just, I don't see, John, how we can go around that one. So. Andy. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. I mean, I guess I'd be okay with the motion, and I agree with Adam in a lot of ways, and I agree with Richard. I think it's, uh, or I mean Frank, excuse me. Um, I think it's important we do it this first year. Um, so I guess I'd be comfortable supporting at least for the first half of the fiscal 18 when we go to the budget and not for the next voting season, but we look at this voting season as opposed to the fiscal year. Because um, it does get really busy, and Maria knows that. I mean, it's, I can see your point of people trying to avoid it just and because they have to stand in line, and I think that could be a problem. And I'm not 100% confident, given the states not being drug into this kicking and screaming, but they're not, they have a lot of concerns at this point. They have enough concerns that I would be worried that potentially we don't necessarily get the best job. They're not fully staffed there all the time, we know that. They get 100,000 visitors there a year. There's gonna be a lot of cars and boats and everything, and you've got one person at the gate that's not someone that knows what they're looking for, what they're doing, or they're not even going to maybe look and see if that seal is still intact or not, but they're going to see the thing on there. So I mean, I guess I think this season we need to do it, but um, one thing from a revenue standpoint, I don't know why we couldn't charge an inspection fee at State Park. We could just say we have inspection as part of your launch fee at City Beach, but you're not paying a launch fee at State Park, so we could generate some revenue with an inspection fee, and I would think that we would have every ability to do that. I don't know why we wouldn't. I mean, it's our lake, it's in our city limits. <coughs> it's at a state park, but you can't get on the lake without a seal, and you can't get a seal without an inspection from the city. And if you're not launching at our dock where you are paying for that launch fee, which includes your inspection fee, then it seems to me that would be a pretty easy thing to do. I mean, I can't see why it couldn't generate at least a little revenue. That's something we can obviously look at if we go into a long-term program. But um, So again, I guess I'd support the motion if we, you know, limit it back to um, for the first half of fiscal 18. Um, we apply the $15,000 from the state towards the offset of the revenue um, needed to fund it for the fiscal 18 portion of that. 
And then just on an editorial note, I think it's really sad that if we look at this budget, less than 10% of it is actually funded by the state. This is a state body of water that's very important to the entire drainage, and they're funding 10%. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, it's really sad. So anyway, that's all my comments. Thanks, Andy. Angie, follow up to Andy's comment. Sure, Andy. In the ordinance, actually, we built in the ability for the city council to set inspection rates by resolution. So that might be something you can look at in the future and, you know, basically say, hey, City Beach, your launch fee includes your inspection for inspections done by city personnel at, you know, State Park, then you can charge the boat owner. Okay. Okay. And I wasn't sure if you are talking about charging the, 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 the state itself and, um, an inspection fee and, you know, I don't think you'd ever get that. But, I mean, that's something you could look for going into the future. Um, for charging for the city, you know, beach ranger or the inspector's time at State Park, you know, something minimal, but it might help you recoup some of the cost. Frank, to Andy's uh, point regarding just evaluating the first half of FY18, meaning this this season, uh, can we imply that uh, via your your motion? Absolutely. Is that Absolutely. okay with the second? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I think my my comments earlier support that. I mean, I'm yep. I'm very concerned about it this year. Okay. I'm very concerned. Before we vote on the original motion, there was one additional request, and the reason I bring it up is because it was brought up, and I don't really want to be here in two weeks or four weeks having this discussion again, but there was a request for the communications plan uh, to the tune of $6,000. Is this something the council would like to consider as a friendly amendment to the original motion? Certainly. Is that a motion? That's a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Motion has been seconded by Councillor Hildner. Further discussion on the friendly amendment? Katie. I think that if we are going to go through and spend all of the, this money on the program, we need to make sure that we are getting the word out to as many users as possible. As a boat user myself, I still struggle following all of the rules and regulations, and I think that public outreach is going to be paramount for the success of this program. Furthermore, by adding the second station, that will help with a little bit of the user pain because it already is going to be a little more difficult to kind of go through the rigmarole of getting your boat launched for the first time. But if we can work through for this first fiscal year as a test, um, as a pilot system and see how it goes, I'm comfortable with spending the little extra cash. Thank you, Katie. All those in favor of amendment number two, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that passes unanimously, Michelle, which brings us back to the original uh, motion as amended. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that motion carries unanimously um, as well. And I just want to give a, a big shout out to Maria, staff, and the folks at Whitefish Lake Institute. I know this wasn't an easy path to, to navigate, and it's the first year and there's always going to be uh, bumps on the road, but we do the best that we can. And at the end, it's all about you know protecting that gem that we call Whitefish Lake. So let's hope for a good inspection season. Let's get some data and see how we can adapt this program into the future. So I want to thank you both in particular. We're back to councilor comments, and I think we're with Andy. This has absolutely nothing to do with city business, but. Um I need to say it anyway. Um, when I was in Vietnam at work last week, which is why I missed the meeting, but anyway, something that's very important to people there is uh, the celebration of uh, a passing of a loved one, particularly a son for a father. And uh, so I was at two of those celebrations while I was there. And it would be very remiss of me if I did not mention my father. It's the 20th anniversary of his passing today, as a matter of fact. And so I really want to say, you know, that my father was a very important part of my life. One of the reasons I'm here, when I first started to think about being on the city council, he looked at me and my father served on a city council, which is one of the reasons I was probably attracted to it. Um, he said to me, um, a fool in his time are soon parted. It was his first words <laughs> to me. But then he also said to me, he said, you know, the time that you will part with will be some of the most valuable and rewarding in your life. And that has truly been the case. And to my father, George, I thank you for that. And uh, I wish he was here today, but he's not. And, but anyway, I just want to remember him today. Right. Thanks, Andy. Further comments from council? 
How about staff? Thanks, we are adjourned. I just want to announce that uh, the city of Whitefish now has an IT professional. Uh, we hired Tanya uh, Blasdell, who started a couple weeks ago. She comes to us with ooh, about 15 years of IT experience, uh, most recently with the Kalispell School District. So if you guys have computer problems, call Tanya. <laughs>